here and we, we've uh, loved the, the trees are so beautiful and uh, even better than that, that looks a little precarious, <laughs> um, even better than that is the fellowship we've had with you all and uh, you've received us so warmly and lovingly and uh, thank you for singing today, that was wonderful, I was, it warmed my heart to see the singing of God's love for us, that was, that was fantastic. And to hear uh, the kids sing too, that everything was just uh, has been so delightful for us. Um, so I, I just want to say I, I don't assume everybody was here both nights. So the first the first night I, I I argued. I looked at a bunch of warning passages, and basically I said the same thing over and over and over again. And that is, we must persevere to the end to be saved. We, we, we must remain in the faith. There, there are these warnings in Scripture, and the warning says that we must continue into the end. We, we, must, uh, we must not let go of the rope. So the, the, I, that's how I interpreted the passages in Hebrews. I interpreted the passage in, passages in Hebrews, the warning passages, to say we must, uh, we must persevere to the end as Christians, those passages are addressed to believers and they're calling upon us to persevere and to remain in the faith. And the issue in those passages is eternal life. So that's what I did Friday night. Then last, last, last night was Saturday night, wasn't it? I'm losing track of the time here. But Saturday night, last night, I, I talked about the, the notion that perseverance uh, perseverance is necessary. Obedience is necessary. Obedience is necessary to be saved. Well, is that then works righteousness? And I argue, even though perseverance and obedience are necessary, it is not works righteousness. Because, first of all, our obedience and perseverance is imperfect. Right? Only perfection, only perfection grants us uh, the ability to stand before God on the last day. So the only way we can stand before God, the only basis by which we can stand before God is the imputation of Christ's perfect righteousness to us. So, so the, the call to persevere, the call to obey, doesn't merit us anything. The, the call to perseverance, the call to obedience can't be the basis of our righteousness. The basis of our righteousness is the, the imputation of Christ's righteousness, which we receive by faith and faith alone. So, so our obedience, our perseverance is necessary, but our obedience ought to be understood as a, a necessary evidence that we really belong to God. And, and so then this morning's message, I want to I say the thesis is perseverance is not perfection. Perseverance is not perfection. So it's somewhat like last night, just looking at it from another angle. When we're called upon to persevere, that's not the same thing as saying we'll be perfect. So, and my fourth message this afternoon, I'll talk about what do those what do those warning passages in Hebrews mean? So I'll, I'll try to unpack that very practically. But today I want to make seven points. Seven is the perfect number, isn't it? Yes. So uh, there's seven days of creation, seven trumpets, seven bowls, seven seals. <laughs> so I have seven points. Um, uh, about perseverance and and perfection. So here's we, here we go. But before we go, let's pray again. Father, we do pray that you would help us to uh, see wonderful things from your law. We know, Lord, that we can hear your words and not really hear them. We know that we are prone to be distracted by many things. Maybe worries in our heart, concerns, maybe uh, just what we're going to do the rest of the day or the rest of this week or the rest of this month. But Lord, we know that you've appointed us to be here at this place and at this time. And so we pray you give us attention. We pray your spirit would open our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so perseverance is not perfection. How do we know that? First of all, we know that because as Christians, we pray every day that our sins will be forgiven. 
their daily prayers for forgiveness. And where do we see that? Well, we see it in the Lord's Prayer. The Lord taught us to pray, Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. I grew up incidentally as a Roman Catholic and I memorized the Lord's Prayer and I said it many times. But I was unregenerate. I said it many times, but I never really meant what I said. <laughs> so, you know, you can know this prayer and not really take it to heart. But you know, I've discovered an interesting thing among some Protestants, not all, some Protestants never pray this prayer. <laughs> you know, they don't even know this prayer very well. So that's, a, that's a, not another extreme, isn't it? One extreme is to say the prayer thoughtlessly all the time. But another extreme is not to have this prayer memorized and not to pray this prayer often. Like, I, just, I don't know what you do in your churches, but I want to challenge you, if you don't do it in your churches, to pray this prayer corporately together, so, quite regularly. It's the prayer that, that Jesus taught us to pray. We ought to be praying it regularly. But, but here's my point for today. Clearly, as believers, we're not perfect until the day of redemption because Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Why did he teach us to pray that prayer? Because we need to pray that regularly until the day we die. If you know early church history, you know there was a debate between uh, Augustine and Pelagius. And Pelagius argued essentially that Christians could be perfect. And Augustine, and you can read today Augustine's anti-Pelagian writings, and Augustine, you know, it's, it's always great to, to read the greats, because it's really rather simple often when you read them. And Augustine said to Pelagius again and again and again, obviously we can't be perfect, Pelagius, because of the Lord's prayer. <laughs> The Lord told us to pray this prayer. Why would he tell us to pray this prayer if we could be perfect? I think that's spot on. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Every day we pray asking God to forgive us. And we see this as well in 1 John, don't we? Chapter 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we're sinless, if we say we're perfect, we deceive ourselves, and when he says the truth is not in us, we're not Christians. We're not believers. The truth there is the truth of the gospel. What does it mean to be a Christian? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So this is very similar to the Lord's Prayer, isn't it? What does it mean to be a Christian? It means we're honest and we confess our sins to one another, to God and to one another, that we admit before God that we are sinners. I have actually heard people say, you know what, we're forgiven of all our sins, past, present, and future. We don't have to forgive, confess our sins anymore. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I've heard it said quite a few times. Hey, all our sins are forgiven. Past, present, and future. We don't have to obey this verse anymore. But I think, be careful, right? Be careful of any teaching that denies a clear verse of Scripture. Right. Yeah, it's true we're forgiven of all our sins, past, present, and future. But it's also true we're supposed to confess our sins. That's, right. That's what this text says to do. It's true. We need to watch out if we begin to get a theology that denies something the text specifically says. It would deny the Lord's Prayer and it would deny this verse. So, perseverance is not perfection. It can't be because we're to pray every day for the forgiveness of our sins. Secondly, perseverance is not perfection because perfection is ours at the resurrection. Mm. We don't have perfection until the resurrection. And here I want to pick up chapter Philippians, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 11. Here's the Apostle Paul speaking. Paul says in verse 11 of Philippians 3, that by any means possible, I may attain 
the resurrection from the dead. That's an interesting verse in its own right, isn't it? Paul speaks of attaining the resurrection of the dead. And then he says, not that I have already obtained this. Okay, so not that I've already obtained this. What's the this? It's the resurrection. Not that I've already obtained the resurrection or am already perfect. So do you see, do you see the logic of the verse? I want to attain the resurrection of the dead, not that I've already attained the resurrection, or I'm already perfect. You see that perfection is ours at the resurrection. <coughs> we will only be perfect when we get resurrected bodies. Paul goes on to say, but I press on to, to make it my own. Or, or you can translate that, I press on to grasp it. So, so I think this is a very interesting verse on, on, perf on perfection because Paul says, I'll only be perfect at the resurrection. And then what does he say? say? So I get back in my recliner and I just sit back and say, let's wait for that day. Now that's not what he does, right? I, 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 I press on to grasp, I, I'm, to grasp that perfection. I press on to make it my own. But notice what he says, because Christ Jesus has grasped me. Mm. I'm, 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 I'm running, I'm running to grasp the prize, right? But I'm only running, I'm only, I'm only persevering because he's grasped me first. So there's the grace of God undergirding all our effort, right? We're running, but he's grabbed us first. Verse 13, brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own. I don't consider that I'm perfect yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. So this is a race image, right? When you're running, you forget what lies behind, forget the, forget the first part of the course, you, you, you keep running. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So we leave behind, don't we? Our successes, have you had some successes? You have, mm -hmm. right? And our failures, you've had those too. We leave those behind. Our, our highs and our lows, our regrets, our triumphs. But we go forward, we run that race to the end, and we won't be perfect until the race is over, until the day of the resurrection. Romans chapter 8, verse 10. Romans chapter 8, verse 10 and 11. But if Christ is in you, that's what it means to be a Christian today, right? What does it mean to be a Christian? Christ is in you. If Christ is in you, and he is in you if you're a Christian, though the body is dead because of sin. So the, the, uh, this is very interesting again, isn't it? The, our bodies, some, some of us more than others, right? But our, our, but our bodies are all dying, aren't they? Some of your bodies are in very good shape. You know, I'm 65, you know, definitely on the downhill path right? <laughs> when you're 65. But um, why, why is that? Why are we dying? Because of sin. And, and as long as we're in the body, right, there's a continuing presence of sin in us. He's not saying the body's sinful. That's not what he's saying. But there's a continuing, continued presence of sin as long as we're in the body which is another way of saying, only when we get new bodies will we be free from sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the Holy Spirit, if he's in you, and he is in you if you're a Christian, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So when's, when's the day you're going to get life? Well, we already have life, don't we? Mm -hmm. We have the spirit. Christ is in us. But there's an already but not yet. Christ is in us. We have the spirit. But we're still waiting for that day when the spirit gives life to our mortal bodies and we're raised from the dead. And that perfection will come and, on that day of resurrection. Two verses. <laughs> I mean, Romans chapter 8, verse 23 is very similar. Just a few verses down. Romans 8, verse 23. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, 
who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. We're already adopted. Other verses tell us that. We're already God's sons and daughters. But we also, while we're in our present bodies, we groan. Maybe, maybe you're groaning today, right? <laughs> I don't know. We all groan some days. Even if you're young and in great health, sometimes you get a cold, right? Sometimes you get the flu. And, uh, and, and, and perhaps <clears throat> some of you, probably for sure in this room, you feel bad every day, <laughs> physically, right? There, there's groaning in, a, in our present bodies. We, 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 wait for, we wait for the fullness of our adoption. We wait for the day of the resurrection. And, and meanwhile, meanwhile we struggle with sin. We don't experience perfection until the day of the resurrection. So perseverance is not perfection because we pray for forgiveness every day and because perfection is at the day of resurrection. And thirdly, Thirdly, we're not perfect yet. The exhortations in the letters show we are not yet perfect. The commands and exhortations and admonitions in the scriptures show we're not yet perfect. One of my favorite verses is 1 Peter 2.11. Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Now this is directed to Christians. What does this verse say? He says, first of all, this is not your home. You're sojourners. You're exiles. Maybe at this time in American history, depends on how much you're aware of these things, we feel that more strongly than maybe 30 years ago. Depends on the person. Some of you weren't here 30 years ago, I know that. <laughs> but I urge you as sojourners and exiles, what does he say? Abstain from the passions of the flesh. So, if you have passions to sin, if you have desires <coughs> to sin, that doesn't mean you're not a Christian. He tells us you have passions of the flesh. How strong are those pass passions? They wage war against our soul. How strong are those passions? They are so strong, it's like a war inside of us. So you know, the Christian life is not a vacation, is it? The Christian life is a battle. And, and it's, it's the battle with the, with the, uh, the enemy inside of us, with, with desires. So if you have strong desires to sin, that doesn't mean you're not a believer. It means you got to go to war, <laughs> right? It means you, what does he say? By the grace of God, we are to abstain from, from those passions. It's a, it's, it's a very interesting thing to me to see how people who, are, who battle against passions, sinful passions, will suddenly say, you know, this is the way God made me. I give up. I'm just going to live this way. Have you heard this? I hear yes. it over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. They have no understanding of what the Bible teaches, right? When they talk like that. That's right. Of course we have sinful passions that we're to resist. It doesn't mean God made you that way just because you have a desire. Right? Maybe, maybe you have a, you know, we can have all kinds of crazy sinful desires. That doesn't mean they're right. As long as we're Christians in this life, we're going to face fierce, intense battle. Galatians chapter 5 Verse 17. I'm just, I'm going to jump up and grab my water. I forgot. <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a water speaker. <laughs> like a camel. I need it. <laughs> Galatians 5.17. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Well, that text is very clear, right? There's Galatians 5.17, we have desires of the spirit and desires of the flesh. And it's the same thing again, isn't it? There's a war, there's a battle, there's a conflict. And we, we need exhortations. And we need the exhortations 
keep fighting. Yeah, I mean, have you ever felt, I've felt this way many times. Can I just live on the grace I had yesterday? Mm. Can, I just, can I just wake up and be, just go on autopilot today? But that's not the Christian life, is it? That's right. Every day is a new day to trust God and, and to go to war. It's, it's, a, it's a battle every day. He leads us besides quiet waters, right? He does that as well. But we're in a spiritual battle as long as we live this life. Romans chapter 8, verse 13. I read this verse, I think, Friday night. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. <coughs> so, we must, we must, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body. We, we, uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 says we have, we have to put to death our, our sinful inclinations. Putting something to death is not easy, right? Think of the image. You have to kill those sinful desires every day, he's saying. But it is not a call to self-effort because he says you do that by the Spirit. That's right. You do that by depending upon the Holy Spirit calling upon the Spirit to help you. And what tool does the Spirit use to help us put to death the deeds of the body? It's God's Word, isn't it? It's God's Word that helps us by the Spirit put to death these sinful desires. So, perseverance is not perfection because as Christians, we pray every day for forgiveness. First, second, perfection is at the day of resurrection. And thirdly, the exhortations and the admonitions in the letters show that we are not yet perfect. And fourthly, even the best Christians can do better. Mm -hmm. Even the best Christians can do better. You know, James says in James chapter 2, we talked about this briefly last night, that, we're, that Christians are justified by works. Not as a basis, but as an evidence and a fruit. Remember that passage? Yes. We're justified. Work, works are necessary for justification. They're, they're a necessary fruit. They're a necessary evidence. But I think it's so interesting. In the very next chapter, chapter 3, verse 2, when James is talking about the tongue, he says, For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. Now, that word stumble, what does he mean when he says we all stumble in many ways? That word stumble means sin. Uh, it, and in James chapter 2, verse 10, he uses the same word. He says, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point, by the way, that's the same word stumble. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails or stumbles in one point has been become accountable for all of it. This is a very important verse, isn't it, on the need for perfection to stand before God. But that's what he says, right? If you keep the whole law but fail at one point, you become accountable for all of it. Imagine this. Imagine you're on trial for murder. And you committed murder. And it's coming near the end of the trial. And you stand up and say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I just want to tell you something right now. Yes, I did commit murder, but I want you all to know I have never committed adultery. That's the example James gives. And what will they say? You're a lawbreaker. <laughs> You're guilty. That doesn't get you off, right? That's James' point. If you fail at one point, you're a lawbreaker. Now we come back to James chapter 3, verse 2. What does James say? We all stumble in many ways. I, I like how James wrote this. Did you notice it? He didn't write. You all stumble in many ways, you bad people. <laughs> right? He didn't write that. He said, we all, he included himself, didn't he? James isn't just pointing the finger, is he? 
He's saying we all stumble in many ways. Oh, he says, did you notice this? We all, not, not, and no one's excluded. Every Christian's included in. We're justified by works, right? But the works can't be the basis, because look at this, we all sin. We, we all sin once in a while, right? Maybe last month you sinned once, did you? Maybe, <laughs> perhaps. That's not what he says. We all stumble in many ways. Many ways we don't probably even see, right? We all stumble. We all sin in many ways. Well, this is true of the best of Christians then, isn't it? That's my point. Even the, even best, the best Christians can do better. 1 Thessalonians 4. You know, 1 Thessalonians... Paul is very happy with this church. He loves this church. This church, they're new Christians, but they're doing really well. They're suffering persecution, and they're responding well. But chapter 4, verse 9, I, this, I, I love this verse. It's so fascinating. Now concerning brotherly love, he says, You have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. Isn't that a wonderful verse? He says, I don't even have to write you about loving one another because God teaches you inside. Isn't that the new covenant? Amen. The law is written on your heart. Amen. You want to love one another now, right? That's, that's a great sign that you're a Christian. Mm -hmm. that, that we don't always love each other, right? We all stumble in many ways, but we want to. We want to. I mean, I have a special affection for you, even though we don't know each other well, because you're Christians. Mm. We're family, aren't mm -hmm. we? Amen. And, uh, you know, I go around a lot of places, and there's just a special bond. We're part of the same family. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? And we, we, we don't succeed perfectly, do we? But we want to love each other. And where did that come from? God wrote it on our heart. And he said, so I don't even need to write to you about that. Well, yes and no. <laughs> Verse 10, for indeed, he says, this is why, another reason I don't need to write you, verse 10, for that indeed is what you're doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. I don't need to write you because God wrote it on your heart and you're doing such a good job. And uh, therefore, Thessalonians, you guys are just perfect. You're the best of the best, of the perfect of the perfect. That's not what he said, right? He says, but we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do this more and more. Isn't that amazing? You can always do better. Doesn't he say that? We, no, none of us have arrived. Even, even, even the best Christians can do better. He says, you guys are loving, you're improving, you're doing well, do better. Mm. By God's grace. Amen. Isn't, I love that. Isn't that great? You know, I think typically, because I teach a lot of pastors and I've been in a lot of churches, sometimes, I know it's true of none of the pastors here, but sometimes pastors get frustrated with their church. <laughs> and when they get frustrated with the church, they can begin to hector their church. Mm. And a tone can come into a pastor's heart and mind. Uh, now, sometimes churches can fall into serious sin and there's got to be a proof, but it's always got to be in love, doesn't it? Mm. And, and, and you feel that from Paul? <clears throat> he really loves these people. And he's telling them how to do better, but he's telling them like a father and mother who love their kids. And there's a different tone there, isn't there? Mm -hmm. the, all exhortation, all exhortation comes out of affirmation and love. I was in a church once in Portland, Oregon, and the pastor was a good guy, but he was getting frustrated with the church. It was a church of about a thousand. And this is what he'd say Sunday morning about coming Sunday nights. He'd go, we're having Sunday night service tonight. And you guys need to be here tonight. And he goes, and some of you don't want to come tonight. And he goes, why don't you want to come tonight? Because you're selfish. That's what you're, like. <laughs> you're selfish. You're bad. You know? I mean, it's just a terrible way to motivate the church. You're like, wow. Like, boom. Smack in the jaw. You're selfish. That's not how Paul exhorts them. Right? right. He says, you're doing well. Do better. You know? We want, to, we want to attract people by saying, you're doing well, come and enjoy it. And if people don't want to come, you know, trip them up later. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, what does Peter say in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18? He says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's, a, that's for all of us, right? Amen. I can't say, well, wait a minute. 
I'm 65 years old. I've been a Christian since I was 17. How many years is that? 48 or something? I, I'm terrible at counting now. Um, <laughs> I've arrived, you know? Everyone be like me, perfect. No, <laughs> it's not true, right? I still need to, you still need to, no matter how long you're a Christian, I still need to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Amen. Lord Jesus Christ until the day I die. Amen. When, you know, what did C.S. Lewis say? Further up and further in. Have you heard that? Yes. Further yes. up and further in. We're, 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 we're never done. We're still growing. So, perseverance is not perfection because first, every day, we pray for forgiveness. Secondly, perfection is not ours until we have new bodies, until the day of resurrection. Third, the exhortations in the letter show we're not yet perfect. And fourth, even the best Christians can do better. Fifth, perfection will be ours in the last day. Now, I've already said this, but I'm going to say it a little different way. Perfection will be ours in the last day. So, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. This is the great passage on husbands and wives. But in the middle of this discussion, he speaks of Christ as the head of the church, and he, and he speaks of what Christ has done for the church. You know, he loved the church. He gave himself for the church. Verse 27, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. This is an eschatological presentation. Mm. Well, let me not use a big word. This is the end time presentation. This has not happened yet, but it's coming. The great wedding day is coming, right? And what's the bride going to be like? That sounds no spot, no wrinkle. Right now, our church, your churches, I don't know your churches, there's spots and wrinkles, right? Clifton Baptist Church, Ryan, we have spots and wrinkles. But the day is coming. Well, there will not be a single blemish. It's like a, it's a wedding day. I was at a wedding Sunday, uh, and uh, the bride looked gorgeous, absolutely beautiful. So if she had any spots and wrinkles, they were covered over. <laughs> she looked fabulous, you know, that day. And it's, it's, a, it's a prelude, right? It's a prelude to that final day mm -hmm. when we will be presented perfect, but we're not perfect now. Right? There's spots and wrinkles now, but there won't be. Colossians chapter 1, verse 22. Very similar. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. That's talking about Christ. You're reconciled to Christ now by his death. In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So again, eschatological presentation. He'll present us holy and blameless and without reproach before him. But that's a last day thing. Yes, we're right before him now, but we will be blameless mm. and flawless on the day we are presented, the day that is coming. Mm -hmm. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. I taught, I said this before, I taught at a Wesleyan school for three years. You know, I had a lovely experience there at Azusa Pacific University. I'm, I was reformed. I told them I was reformed when I hired them. Uh, it's a very fascinating story how I got hired. My first job, I got hired at a Wesleyan school <laughs> as a person who was not a Wesleyan. Now, that made me believe in the sovereignty of God. You know? I desperately needed a job. You know, I was 29 years old and nobody wanted to hire me, you know? I had no experience, you know? You, you know how that is when you're young, you know? I call up, can I, can I apply for the job? How much experience do you have? I have none. How do you get a job? How do you first get a job? Right. Right. It's catch 22. But anyway, um, I never met anybody who claimed entire sanctification, but that is in Wesleyan theology, and they use this verse. In, in Wesleyan theology, they say he prays that he'd sanctify you completely, and Wesleyans say, John Wesley himself said that you could be perfected in holy love, and they say that you can uh, experience such perfection in this life, but I think that's a mistake. Let's keep reading the verse. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless 
at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do that. And I understand that to say, it's future tense. He will surely perfect you at the last day, but not in this life. Perfection does not come in this life. It only comes when we have that end time presentation. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. Is it, I love that, right? What is life going to be like in the new creation? We actually do not know. We actually do not see specifically what our lives will be like. It's hidden from us, isn't it? There's kind of a curtain. Yeah, we're, we're going to have new bodies. We're going to do great and exciting things, but much is hidden. But we know that when he appears, when Jesus comes back, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Isn't that an interesting text? When we see him, we will be like him, which implies we're not like him yet, not completely, not perfectly. But when we see him, it's like a radiating power will come from him. We will be transformed. We will see him as he is, and we will be perfected. So, perseverance is not perfection because we pray every day for forgiveness because perfection is at the day of resurrection. Thirdly, the exhortations in the letters show we are not yet perfect. Fourthly, even the best Christians can do better. And fifth, perfection will be ours in the last day. And then sixth, I'm going to give two examples, especially one. The first example is Zechariah. Zechariah, I'm talking about Zechariah, the husband of Elizabeth, the father of John the Baptist. And we read in Luke chapter 1, verse 6, and they, both Zechariah and Elizabeth, were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Were they perfect? Walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Were Zechariah and Elizabeth perfect? No, that's not what that means. That means that they were obedient yes. and devoted Christians who confessed their sins regularly. And actually, in this very chapter, Zechariah sins, doesn't he? Do you remember? Chapter 1, verse 18. We just look down the page. The, the angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah and says, yeah, they're a very old couple, right? How old they were, we don't know, but they were past childbearing. And the uh, angel Gabriel appears and says, you're going to have a son and so forth and so on. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Let me translate it. I don't believe a word you're saying. <laughs> right? That's what he's saying. That's a nice story, but that's just, this is impossible. And the angel said to him, how do you know this? Um, I'm Gabriel. I'm an angel. Appearing to you right now? Has that ever happened to you before? No? Uh, ding, 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 wake up. I'm an angel standing right before you in the temple. That's never happened to you before in your life. God sent me to you. Hello. Wake up. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. How do you know it's going to happen? Because I just told you. And I'm an angel. And plus, he doesn't say this, but read your Bible. Right? Do you remember Abraham and Sarah? This has happened before, mm, right? Yes. Abraham and Sarah. Remember, remember uh, Hannah and Elkanah? So forth and, uh, and other stories of this, right? Isaac and Rebekah and so forth and so on. And behold, you will be silent, unable to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Mm. You didn't believe my words. That's sin. You have sinned, Zechariah. Zechariah was a godlike man. 
Gable's not saying, you're a horrible person, <laughs> right? You're a terrible believer. He's not saying that, is he? That, it doesn't take away from chapter 1, verse 6, one bit. Did Zechariah and Elizabeth, were they still walking blamelessly in all the commandments of the Lord? Absolutely. He remained a godly man, but he was imperfect, wasn't he? He was still a sinner until the day he died. Perseverance is not the same thing as being perfect. Did Zechariah persevere until the end? Absolutely he did. He was a godly man. But he wasn't a perfect man. And then our last example is Peter. You know, I, I talked about Peter last night. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be brief on this. I talked about Peter last night in terms of uh, him denying Jesus. But even after Pentecost, right, Galatians chapter 2, he sinned again, mm -hmm. didn't he? And that probably wasn't the last time he sinned. So he's eating, right, he's eating with the, with the Gentiles. And then James sends the messengers up and says the Jews are really scandalized by what you're doing. Peter gives in the fear and hypocritically quits eating with the Gentiles because he's afraid. Mm. And Paul rebukes Peter in front of everyone for his hypocrisy and his fear and for, in effect, denying the gospel. And of course, Peter repented, didn't he? Yes. Peter repented in turn. So we see, we see with these six arguments, perseverance is not perfection because we pray for forgiveness every day. Perfection is ours at the resurrection. The exhortations in the letters show we are not yet perfect. Fourth, even the best Christians can do better. Fifth, perfection will be ours in the last day. And then we have examples. We have examples of people who fall into sin. Now I just want to say one more thing, a little a little thing that I want to tag on. How do we know we'll be perfected? Because of God's promises. That's why. Because this is the last thing I want to say. Philippians 1, 6. I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work and you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That work is not over yet. Right. But it will be. <laughs> right? Because if, if you're a Christian, if you're really a Christian and God began a good work in you and that you have trust in him and believe in him, then, then he'll complete it, right? And, and it ultimately isn't, perseverance is ultimately not our work, is it? Mm -hmm. Ultimately it's his work. Ultimately it's what he's going to do. And he promises to do it. He began the good work, he'll complete the good work. Romans chapter eight, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, how about this? Paul gives us the list. Now, Paul says, let's think about the things that could separate us. How about tribulation? How about, the, how about the pressures and stresses of life? How about distress? How about persecution? How about, who knows what will happen in our lives, but how about getting your head slowly cut off by an Islamic terrorist? It's happened to Christians, hasn't it? How about that? Does that separate you from the love of Christ? How about famine? How about starving to death? Have some Christians starved to death? Absolutely. Some Christians have starved to death. How about not having enough clothing, nakedness? How about being in danger or the sword? As it is written, for your sake, O Christ, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. We're God's people, and yet we face punishment. But he says, no. And all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Why are we more than conquerors? Because God takes those things. God takes those things that are our enemies and makes them into our friends, doesn't he? He takes those things that are against us and actually makes us stronger. That doesn't mean they're pleasant, but he makes us strong through the things that hurt. So I'm sure, he says, we are... Uh, for I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We'll never fall away. Praise God. Right? Because nothing in creation, and that includes your free will. Mm. Right? That's a part of creation. Nothing in creation can separate us 
from the love of God in Christ mm -hmm. Jesus our Lord. So I just end today by saying, look, perseverance is not the same thing as perfection, but perfection is coming. And, 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 and I'm, I've been focusing on perseverance, but I end by saying it's, it's actually also preservation, right? God preserves us. God keeps us. God, God sustains us. We, we don't, ultimately, we don't, we, don't, we don't make it because of anything we do, although we do do things, right? But ultimately, the only way we make it is by the grace of God. By the grace of God, Paul says, I am what I am. But do you notice what he says next? Yet I labored harder than them all. <laughs> but not I. But not I. But the grace of God. Which was what? <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word, which is so practical and which comforts us as we recognize the continuing presence of sin in us. Lord, there's no excuse ever for any sin, but we recognize until the day we die, we pray the Lord's Prayer, asking you to forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. So, Lord, give us uh, strength, and Lord, we just pray that you'd fulfill your promise to preserve us until the end for the glory of your great name. Amen.